as I said, I am here to uh, open the plenary session this morning, and I'm going to leave you guys with leave you guys off with the idea that what we're going to hear about today is no less than a turning point in the history of the universe, or maybe at least the Earth. And we'll start with some of the major turning points. I'll give you the origin of life. I'm going to throw plate tectonics into that idea, but. Right up there in the top three was the ability for life to harvest light from the sun. And early stages, that would have been light uh, and oxygenic photosynthesis. And followed pretty closely by that, the great oxidation event and the evolution of oxygenic photosynthesis. So these are some of the, these are like the big four I would give you for the early Earth. So I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Bob Blankenship. He's the Lucille Markey Distinguished Professor of Arts and Sciences in the Departments of Biology and Chemistry at Washington University in St. Louis. I had the great pleasure of listening to Bob talk about the chemistry of photosynthesis a long time ago, even before I got to ASU. And it was really kind of a profound experience for me. I had never really thought about it from a chemistry standpoint. Bob's been studying photosynthesis for his entire career, and he has a long-standing interest in addition to the gory details of how photosynthesis works in the origin and early evolution of photosynthesis. And so today he's going to talk to us about the evolutionary transition from oxygenic to anoxygenic photosynthesis. And I'd like you all to welcome Bob Blankenship. Thank you, Hillary. As you can see, it's the transition from anoxygenic to oxygenic. We, we do think that anoxygenic came first. So uh, uh, anyway, I'd like to thank uh, Hillary for the invitation and the organizing committee for the, uh, for the invitation to come and talk with you today. It's, uh, I always enjoy coming to these uh, ABSICON meetings and uh, interacting. They're always very mind-expanding events, and it's, uh, it's really a, a lot of fun. And so I'm pleased today to uh, sort of give you an overview of what we know and what we don't know about the origin and early development of photosynthesis, and I'll focus in on that transition between anoxygenic and oxygenic photosynthesis, which, as Hillary said, was one of the great uh, turning points in the history of life on Earth. Now, I like this. Uh, this diagram, and this uh, is, uh, was drawn by uh, Michael Hegelberg from uh, ASU some years ago, and it's, I think it's a nice metaphor for the process of photosynthesis, and I like to start talks out with this, because we have a, a machine, a device that takes the sun's energy and through some sort of a mechanism converts it into a, a more usable form. and. Uh, in the, in the case of uh, photosynthesis, we're absorbing uh, sunlight and we're doing chemical uh, redox chemistry to store that energy and uh, ultimately use it to power uh, life. Now, in terms of what organisms can do photosynthesis, I think that's a useful place to sort of start our discussion. If we look at this uh, 16S tree of life, I think this is one that Norm Pace did some years ago, and we color in all those taxa that are capable of some form of chlorophyll-based photosynthesis. I'll limit my discussion today to chlorophyll-based photosynthesis. We'll see that we find a lot of different groups uh, that can do photosynthesis in the bacterial domain, and several, of course, in the eukaryotic, uh, eukaryotic dom domain, uh, plants, and so on. Uh, Surprisingly, perhaps, we find nothing in the archaeal domain. So there's no evidence that photosynthesis uh, has ever uh, existed uh, in the archaeal domain. And if we look at the process of photosynthesis that goes on in eukaryotic organisms, it's clear that that process has, uh, has taken place because of a large-scale uh, horizontal gene transfer, if you will, called endosymbiosis, in which a cyanobacterium was incorporated into a proto-eukaryotic cell and ultimately 
became the eukaryotic chloroplast. And the, the mechanism of photosynthesis in eukaryotes is actually surprisingly similar to how it works in cyanobacteria. So really, if we want to understand the sort of early development of photosynthesis, we really don't need to go any farther than the cyanobacteria. So the, the bacteria are the place where we look to to try to understand the origin and the early development of photosynthesis. And the, we can sort of arbitrarily, well, not arbitrarily, but uh, logically divide the, the different groups of uh, phototrophs into the so-called oxygenic, which means they produce oxygen. Uh, and the only group of oxygenic uh, phototrophs are uh, uh, the um, uh, cyanobacteria in the bacterial domain, or anoxygenic. And there are several different groups, all these groups that have either a green or a purple uh, oval on them are, uh, are anoxygenic, and the one that has a bicolor oval here is the cyanobacteria. So just a couple of slides on sort of the basics of how photosynthesis works as an as a energy storage process. And there's a universal uh, organi organizing principle that we find in all photosynthetic organisms that most of the pigments, and these green circles are uh, representative of pigments, whether they're chlorophylls or carotenoids or bilins or other types of pigments that uh, drive photosynthesis, most of those serve as an energy uh, light harvesting antenna and uh, carry out energy transfer. So a photon will be absorbed, cause an electronic transition in a molecule, in one of the pigment molecules, and then that energy will, will migrate through a pigment array uh, and eventually be delivered to a, a protein complex in the membrane that's called the reaction center, and that drives electron flow. So that's the sort of uh, schematic picture of how uh, photosynthesis is organized, really in all known chlorophyll-based phototrophs. And uh, so all uh, photosynthetic organisms have a light-gathering antenna system and an electron-transferring reaction center. You can sort of think of this as uh, analogous to a satellite dish where the antenna is the dish and the reaction center is the receiver which transduces the, the uh, signal. Now, if we look in more detail at these antenna systems, and I'm not going to dwell too much on antennas, although we actually spend most of our time uh, in my lab uh, working out the sort of uh, details of how these antennas are put together and how they work, you see this is just a little rogues gallery of uh, different types of uh, antenna complexes. <coughs> and they're remarkably diverse. Uh, they clearly have multiple different structural motifs in terms of the types of proteins. Usually the pigments are, are bound to, uh, to proteins in very specific environments. Uh, and and the, uh, the antenna complexes are physically nearby to the reaction center complexes. Some of them uh, are actually uh, surround the reaction center, which is in the, uh, in the core, in the, in the hole in the middle there. And so there are a variety of direct of, uh, ways that this is accomplished. And the, the uh, overall picture that one comes away with from this is that these antenna complexes almost certainly have arisen through evolution on multiple occasions. And they've solved a particular uh, problem that an organism might have in terms of its photic environment, whether it's deep in the water column, whether it's underneath another layer of organisms that are shading out part of the solar spectrum, uh, whether it's in extremely dim light conditions, such as this uh, chlorosome that you find in the green sulfur bacteria, which uh, have incredibly strong light gathering light absorbing powers. Uh, and so these things have evolved multiple times. After the initial uh, origin and evolution of photosynthesis. So that's one sort of take home message that the antennas have appeared on multiple occasions. Here's one just sort of schematic picture to kind of give you a flavor of how these antennas 
work. This is a, oops, a computational model that was built on a lot of biochemical information. Uh, and it shows uh, this green is, a, uh, is one of the antenna complexes that was on that earlier slide. And you can actually see the chlorophyll molecules there. A photon comes in, and there'll be an energy transfer process. Energy will migrate, and then to this red, which is another type of antenna complex. And then it will finally hop into the purple reaction center there, and that's where the photochemistry, the, the electron transfer process, takes place. And there's a lot of interesting things that one can uh, learn about the, the structure of these complexes, the mechanism of how the energy is transferred, the kinetics of it. Uh, pathways. There's a lot of really interesting uh, science that uh, has been done and it continues to be done on these sorts of systems. In contrast, the reaction center complexes uh, have a much more sort of conservative design uh, element to them. And if you, we're fortunate enough to have uh, high resolution uh, x-ray structures of several different reaction center complexes from different kinds of organisms. And they don't look so similar up here with all the proteins and extra subunits on them. But if you strip away the protein and just put the cofactors in it, and these cofactors are buried in these structures uh, up above, you can see there's a sort of a unified uh, arrangement of the way these cofactors work. There's a dimer of, of pigments that is down here at the bottom, and that's sort of the initial uh, uh, place where uh, the photochemistry starts, an electron is transferred from one of these uh, uh, chlorophylls to a second chlorophyll and then up a, up a chain. And depending on the type of reaction center, there'll be a difference in the, uh, in the electron acceptor, whether it's a quinone type uh, system that you see in, uh, in photosystem two and in the purple bacterial reaction centers or a uh, a uh, uh, iron sulfur centers that you see in photosystem one and the other type, so-called type one reaction centers. And we classify the reaction centers in terms of the, the type of acceptor they have, the type ones, the ones that have uh, iron sulfur centers, and the type twos are the ones that have these quinone acceptors. And for a long time, it was not clear whether or not there was any sort of deeper homology uh, evolutionary uh, unity between these reaction centers, or whether it ended and there had been two independent inventions. But as the structures of these things started to accumulate in the late 90s, and, and uh, that it became clear that there was an underlying very deep structural homology amongst these things. And you can see that this is now a, uh, energy, what we call an energy kinetic diagram. And you've probably all seen the, the famous Z scheme of photosynthesis that uh, is applicable to cyanobacteria and other oxygenic organisms with photosystem two, which oxidizes water to molecular oxygen and reduces NADP, and, and an inner uh, complex uh, electron transport chain. Um, and then the, the various anoxygenic forms and the type two have a very similar uh, structure to the uh, photosystem two and the type one reaction centers from the anoxygenics have a similar structure to the uh, photosystem one. And so it became clear that these sorts of um, structural similarities applied between the different classes. And then if you really got down deep into the uh, system, it became clear, and I'll come back to this a little bit later. I guess I got a little ahead of myself. Uh, and that all of the reaction centers ultimately come from a common evolutionary origin. And really only ha has only been uh, invented one time uh, during the course of evolution. So. <clears throat> This is a diagram which is uh, obviously impossible to assimilate in a short uh, look, which uh, details the various types uh, of photosynthetic prokaryotes. And there, there are now seven different uh, bacterial phyla that can do photosynthesis. <coughs> That's up from six just a couple of years ago. And uh, 
that they have remarkably diverse set of cofactors or, or uh, complexes that are involved in photosynthesis. And this shows just sort of the, uh, the, uh, the different possibilities that are there. And you can think of them as different modules. For example, this is one of the antenna modules. Here's a different type of antenna. Here's a reaction center. Uh, we have cytochrome complexes in the middle that uh, connect the photosystems or connect the uh, cyclic uh, schemes. And each of these modules actually has a unique evolutionary history, not just the reaction centers, but the antenna complexes and the uh, cytochrome complexes and so on. So it becomes a, a, a very sort of nonlinear complex uh, process to try to understand. So I'm going to take just a couple of minutes here to uh, introduce a little bit of detail about some of the different types of anoxygenic uh, bacteria. And the one that's probably the best understood are the proteobacteria, or oftentimes called the purple bacteria. And they're the ones that the first photosynthetic reaction center structure was determined for some, uh, some years ago. And they operate in a completely cyclic uh, electron transfer uh, pathway, in that light drives the electrons across the membrane, and these are always membrane-associated phenomena. And that electron then uh, comes back across the membrane and ultimately gets transferred through a soluble carrier back to the reaction center. So the light basically drives electrons clockwise around this circle. And you might say, well, what's What's the point of that? Does that get you anything? Well, coupled to that electron flow is a directional flow of protons, or a pumping of protons across the membrane. This is the periplasm of the cell down here at the bottom. And so protons accumulate here, and they then flow back through the ATP synthase. And that's really how the organism is able to transduce uh, the energy of the photon into chemical energy is through this cyclic electron flow coupled to uh, directional proton movement and ultimately ATP um, synthesis. And this proton motive force, as the uh, proton and electrical gradient is, is called, can actually power a number of things besides just ATP synthesis, and that sort of forms the, the nature or the basis of the energetic uh, budget of these cells. Um, these organisms uh, do this cyclic electron flow. They, they can do a reverse electron flow to reduce pyridine nucleotide to serve as the reductant for carbon fixation. They use the Calvin-Benson cycle, the same as you find in higher plants, for their uh, carbon fixation. Uh, mechanism. Here's another one of my favorite uh, organisms. These are the green sulfur bacteria, and these are the champions of low light photosynthesis. They have this giant chlorosome complex here, which is packed with hundreds of thousands of pigments, uh, and it can operate under extreme low light intensities uh, and uh, energy uh, photons will be absorbed by these chlorophylls, which are generally not associated with, pig with proteins in this chlorosome. They're, they're self-assembled into large oligomeric complexes. And then there's a directional energy flow that goes back down into the membrane and uh, to the reaction center. This is a, one of the type 1, or iron sulfur, uh, cluster acceptor uh, reaction centers. And so they're very, very capable of living under extreme low light intensities, you can do a back of the envelope calculation and, and, and convince yourself that the, each photon, each chlorophyll in this antenna complex under the sort of limiting, light limiting conditions will absorb one photon every eight hours. And so they really <laughs> have figured out how to, how to make, uh, how to do photosynthesis at the very low limit. And so if you're looking for a system that might be operable under extreme low light conditions, uh, say on Europa or something of that sort, uh, you might look to this system as a, uh, as a model. They're strict anaerobic organisms generally, and they use a different carbon fixation cycle. They use a reverse TCA cycle for carbon fixation. And so it's really quite different in, the, in what the purple bacteria will do.
Now, one of my favorite organisms, and one that we've seen several pictures of, are the filamentous anoxygenic phototrophs, FAPs. Uh, the most famous uh, example of that is Chloroflexus orontiacus. And Chloroflexus is a really interesting uh, organism because it's sort of a poster child for horizontal gene transfer. It has the reaction center complex that's very structurally and mechanistically similar to what you find in the purple bacteria. I mean, it's really remarkably similar. And it has this antenna complex, the chlorosome, like I was describing before, that's very similar to what you find in the green sulfur bacteria. It uses a completely different carbon fixation pathway, this 3-hydroxy propionate cycle. And it also has its own uh, type of uh, cytochrome complex. It does not use the cytochrome BC complex that's found in many of the other types of organisms. It uses a, uh, uh, a newly discovered complex called Alternative Complex 3, which is mechanistically and structurally entirely different from the, the one that's found in other organisms. But it is also found in a number of non-photosynthetic uh, bacteria. So here's an organism that's kind of been assembled from parts, it seems like, and uh, it's, a, it's a wonderfully uh, uh, sort of charismatic organism. Uh, those of us who've been to Yellowstone have seen it everywhere there, and it's, uh, it's been, I've, we've worked on it for many years, and it's been a, always a surprise. It, whatever chloroflexus does always does it a little bit different from any other organism. This is another, these are like my children, so you have to <laughs> realize that I love each one of them, but in a different way. <laughs> uh, these are the heliobacteria, and these are really uh, interesting organisms. They were discovered some years ago by Howard Guest from Indiana, and they're the only gram-positive phototrophic bacteria. Uh, so they're interesting in that respect. They, they have... Uh, the simplest known uh, photosynthetic uh, apparatus. They have no separate antenna system. The antenna, there are some antenna pigments that are part of the reaction center core complex, and so there's like 30 or so uh, antenna pigments that are associated with that, but they don't have any of these, of these other distinct or these large peripheral antenna complexes. They uh, we don't really quite understand the mechanism of their, inter of their electron flow very well. Probably they do a cyclic flow, and it, it probably involves uh, the complex one NDH uh, uh, dehydrogenase type of uh, complex. The other thing about them is that they're not capable of photoautotrophic uh, metabolism, so they don't know how to do carbon fixation. Uh, and so they have to live photoheterotrophically. They're found in, in places like rice paddies and so on, where they actually make up a, a fairly significant population. And they're very active nitrogen-fixing organisms. And so they, they have interesting properties uh, in that respect. But if you're looking for the most primitive phototroph, the heliobacteria are probably your best candidate. This one's interesting because it is the most recently discovered, and I'm not going to try to pronounce that name, but it's a, uh, a phylum of bacteria that just a few years ago, and there's really just a couple of papers on this uh, group now, uh, was discovered to uh, be phototrophic, photosynthetic, and it has an apparatus that if you look at the spectra and the kinetic properties and so on, you swear it was a purple photosynthetic bacterium. It has exactly the same sort of uh, antenna complexes and reaction center and so on. And in, in fact, if you look at the way the genes are clustered for, for doing photosynthesis in the purple bacteria, there's what's called a photosynthesis gene cluster in that you've got about 40 some kilobases of genetic material that's all clustered together that's basically everything you need to, to know to do uh, photosynthesis. And this, this group has basically stolen that, uh, that cluster, imported it through horizontal gene transfer, and has made it work in, in this other, uh, other group. So here's a, a sort of a smoking gun case of, of uh, uh, horizontal gene transfer for um, that, uh, that 
has just recently been discovered. So we don't know too much about how it works, but it's, it's still a very interesting system. And finally, the cyanobacteria, which is the ones that everyone knows about. And these are the, the most sort of uh, mechanistically sophisticated of all the photosynthetic prokaryotes. They have both photos, they have photosystem one and photosystem two, and they have, uh, so they have a type one and a type two reaction center, uh, and they're connected together uh, through an electron transport chain. And so they do primarily a non-cyclic electron flow, which extracts electrons from water and delivers them to, um, to NADP, which then goes on to, uh, to reduce CO2 in the Calvin-Benson cycle. And they have uh, also proton pumping and uh, ATP synthesis that they uh, can do. And they're also capable of a cyclic form of uh, electron flow around photosystem one. They have these wonderful giant antenna complexes called phycobilisomes, which looks like a, a space alien of some sort. And uh, they have uh, these rod uh, elements here that uh, are packed with bilin pigments. These are open chain tetraproles, not chlorophylls, but they uh, are covalently linked to the proteins and sort of are like little light pipes that that direct the energy down uh, to a core structure, and then it comes into the reaction centers. And these show, this uh, shows both photosystem two, and recently we discovered that photosystem one can also be associated with this. So this is a sort of a little module that can do at least the majority of the electron transfer part of, uh, of photosynthesis. So these are really the organisms that have had a lot of attention. They uh, they. They do the Calvin-Benson cycle for uh, carbon fixation. And the, the evolutionary origin of the cyanobacteria is one of the really great unsolved questions and interesting questions. I'll come back to that right at the end of the talk. So if we want to try to understand the origin and the early evolution of photosynthesis, I hope by now you get the sense that there are all these modules, the antennas, the reaction centers of different types, the electron transfer components, and so on, carbon fixation machineries. And each of these modules has its own unique evolutionary history. And so they, in a way, it's kind of mix and match what you find in the different classes of photosynthetic organisms. One will have this type of antenna, and another one will have this type of reaction center, or that type of uh, carbon fixation. Uh, machinery. And you really need to try to understand uh, all of these different modules, if you will, and their unique evolutionary histories to try to get the big picture of the evolution and development of photosynthesis. And it's very clear from a lot of uh, lines of evidence now that horizontal gene transfer has been widespread amongst the bacteria, and a lot of these modules have been passed around, and that has what ultimately has given rise to this very sort of scattered pattern that you find in the bacterial domain. Why that never transferred over to the archaeal domain uh, is a question that I don't have a good answer for. OK, so let's put a few dates down. Uh, unfortunately, we don't really know when photosynthesis started. Almost certainly, uh, it, it appeared well after LUCA. And uh, so it's not something that was, was one of the very earliest uh, metabolic processes. There's evidence for anoxygenic photosynthesis at 3.4 billion years ago. It's from Don Lowe's lab. And so all, certainly by then, I think some form of anoxygenic photosynthesis was operating. Oxygenic photosynthesis, there's such a lot of di discussion on, about that. And of course, the great oxidation event that I'm sure you're all familiar with that took place around 2.4 billion uh, is generally accepted to be due to the action of cyanobacteria. So that's sort of the latest possible time that oxygenic photosynthesis uh, was invented. Uh, but earlier constraints on the, the earliest appearance of it are a lot trickier. And I think, I won't say there's consensus, but there's at least uh, a lot of uh, indications that 2.7 or so 
uh, might have been uh, a reasonable time. And probably it didn't just sort of appear all at once in full-blown glory like we see it in the cyanobacteria. Undoubtedly, there was a significant uh, development where it didn't work very well at first. And uh, of course, when, once you start producing oxygen, you're poisoning your neighbors and yourselves. And so you uh, have to deal with developing oxygen protection systems and so on. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, questions about that. Now, in terms of the pigments, I haven't talked too much about the types of, of uh, pigments but we, we have these beautiful chlorophyll pigments that you find in all types of phototropes. Those are certainly not the original uh, pigments. Probably they were simpler porphyrin-type pigments that uh, even some of those can be prebiotic or, or they share the first part of that biosynthetic pathway with cytochrome uh, heme biosynthesis. And so probably the first pigments were, were of that sort those don't absorb light very well in the visible region. And so once you start sort of fiddling with the substituents, making them less uh, symmetric, putting on different types of functional groups, then you get a significant change in the absorption properties. The, the pigment absorbs much more in the red region and has a much higher uh, extinction coefficient, so it becomes much better suited uh, to be a, a photosynthetic pigment. And so there's undoubtedly a long process of that kind of evolution that went on. I think it's certainly the case that the reaction centers uh, predate the antennas. The, the sort of the worst idea you can have is an antenna without a reaction center, because then you're absorbing a bunch of light and you don't have any way to process it. And so you really, uh, that wouldn't have worked at all. And so, and the evolutionary picture of the, of the antenna uh, sort of support that idea that they're very varied and seem to uh, have uh, almost certainly come in at a, uh, at a late time. If we try to understand in a little bit more detail the evolution of the reaction center, this is now just focusing in on that one module, the reaction center, and uh, try to, to get a sort of a unified picture of this. This is not so easy because the, the residual sequence identity between the type 1 and the type 2 reaction centers is down around 10% or so. So they're very distant. Uh, but when you do those structural uh, comparisons, when you look at the structures, and uh, you, can, you can realize that the, uh, the structural conservation persists much longer than sequence uh, conservation. This is well known in molecular evolution. So some years ago, we, we uh, used the known structures of the reaction centers to do a, a, a global sort of uh, phylogenetic analysis and uh, came up with a, a tree and then based that tree uh, then did some additional sequence analysis on that tree. And this is sort of what came out. And <clears throat> what we have is, this is an inferred position for the root, but we have these early reaction centers, and then the time will flow out in both directions here, uh, that were almost certainly what we call homodimers. Uh, all the reaction centers, uh, or most of them, are what we call heterodimers in that you've got two protein uh, subunits in the core, which are similar but not identical, and they've clearly resen resulted from a gene duplication event. And here in photosystem one, you can see that very clearly, and that's shown there are actually three of these events that are inferred from the tree, and uh, they're indicated by stars here. And so we have the two halves of the photosystem one heterodimer, which originated from this gene duplication and then subsequent divergence. But there are actually two groups, and the green sulfur bacteria and the heliobacteria, I didn't mention this at the time, they have what's called a homodimeric reaction center. There's only one gene, and it forms a, a complex with two identical uh, subunits. And that's clearly a more primitive arrangement. <coughs> and so these things, we think, uh, fit into the, uh, 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 and, they, and they've entered the tree here in a position that uh, it indicates that they're more closely related to the ancestral reaction center. Now, if you want to look at where the oxygen evolution occurs in photosystem two, uh, you've got only this one group uh, is uh, capable of oxygen, uh, 
uh, oxygenic photosynthesis, and that's photosystem two in the cyanobacteria. And that's clearly a more derived uh, position in the tree, and so that uh, is something that developed at a much later time. So this kind of gives an overall picture of the, uh, of the evolution of the reaction center uh, part of the system. I think I'll skip this slide. Uh, so if we just summarize this, uh, what I would call mosaic evolution of photosynthesis, if we want to find a, uh, a photosynthetic cell nowadays, we have to understand that different parts of that photosynthetic apparatus may have uh, had different evolutionary origins and have been brought in through horizontal gene transfer at, uh, at different times and in different, from different, uh, different sources. So that means that there's no sort of single uh, evolution of photosynthesis that you can point to, a single sort of branching tree. It's a, I used to think that that was sort of the holy grail, that we'd try to find that, that one branching tree for uh, how photosynthesis evolved. And then at some point it dawned on me that such a thing really wasn't possible. It didn't exist. And you have to think of it in this much more nar sort of nonlinear uh, uh, way. OK. Uh, cyanobacteria have the distinction of being the only phototrophs that can do oxygenic, only uh, prokaryote that can do oxygenic photosynthesis. And I've talked a bit about them. But there's just recently been a very interesting paper that came out in, in Science by Sue et al. And uh, what they did was analyzed uh, a bunch of cyanobacterial genomes, but they've also analyzed a bunch of non-photosynthetic uh, relatives of the cyanobacteria. And these were just discovered recently. And the, the first one that was discovered are called the melanobacteria. And then they have another uh, group that they discovered in this recent paper, just came out about a month ago, uh, called the series cytochromata. And these are both uh, clearly the closest known relatives to the cyanobacteria in terms of, uh, and they did, it's not just 16S, but they did, I think, 100 gene uh, analysis, uh, whole genome or partial genome analysis. And it shows this kind of a topology. Uh, it's, this is oversimplified. But the basic idea here is that these, uh, the cyanobacteria, what we what we call the cyanobacteria, the oxygen uh, evolving phototrophs, uh, are related to these organisms. And if you look in the genomes of these organisms, there's not a single trace of any photosynthesis genes at all. And uh, so the, the simplest explanation of that is that this ancestor of, of all these groups was almost certainly a non-photosynthetic cell and probably was also an anaerobe because they analyzed the uh, appearance of different types of terminal uh, respiratory systems. Uh, and that, that suggests that the uh, cyanobacteria, uh, when they first branched off, were probably also not photosynthetic. And they imported various aspects of their photosynthetic apparatus through horizontal gene transfer and then developed into the uh, the rich group uh, that we know them today. I mean, there are, there are possible ways around this conclusion, but it's certainly the simplest conclusion, given the information that we have now, that this ancestor of the cyanobacteria was not photosynthetic, and it clearly has, uh, has developed that ability because of the, the clear evolutionary connection to the various anoxygenic uh, uh, modules of the, of the photosynthetic apparatus clearly has uh, developed that, not de novo, but through uh, horizontal gene transfer. So this is an interesting, uh, fairly recent development. It doesn't solve the question, the sort of big question, of where did the, the ability to make oxygen really come from. And that, uh, that's the so-called oxygen evolving complex. And I think. Um, this is just a, a, a sort of a schematic picture that shows how these anoxygenic uh, organisms at some point uh, transitioned to be uh, the cyanobacteria. Uh, and 
what we have are a lot of missing links here in terms of uh, we don't really have any intermediate uh, stages of those. But the, the business end of, of the cyanobacteria uh, is photosystem two, and this is, uh, we now have very nice uh, structures of these, and there's a lot of ef effort to try to understand the mechanistic aspects of how the oxygen is produced from water. And thermodynamically, this is a very difficult problem. Uh, this just shows the arrangement of the cofactors, and again, here's this dimer and the electron flow. Uh, because of this heterodimeric uh, nature, it goes just down one side of this electron transport chain. And then down here is the oxygen evolving center, and this is this, the famous manganese center that uh, will take uh, oxidizing equivalents, which are generated here uh, at the chlorophyll, and through a, a tyrosine uh, residue, uh, the, uh, the electrons, uh, the holes, if you will, will be transferred down to the oxygen evolving center. And here's a little bit of a blow up of the, of the uh, structure of that center. It consists of four manganese ions and one calcium, and it has a very sort of unique structure uh, in the protein. Uh, the complications of this are that it's, it's a four electron process. So you have to, in a sense, store up four oxidizing equivalents before you can oxidize waters to molecular oxygen. So that gives you uh, a mechanistic constraint that's, that's quite severe. It's also a very thermodynamically difficult reaction. As you know, it's, it's hard to oxidize water. It's not a good reductant. Uh, and so you need to have a very strongly oxidizing system to, uh, to pull the electrons away from water. Uh, and so you need a very strong uh, redox potential of the, of the complex to oxidize the water. And you, you have this charge accumulating system uh, to accumulate four oxidizing uh, equivalents. And these are thought to be uh, resident on these manganese ions as uh, successively more and more oxidized forms of the manganese. And there's been a huge amount of research done to try to understand the mechanism of how this works uh, using all kinds of different techniques, EPR and, and X-ray absorption and, and so on. It's really a very intense uh, area, and I think there's been a lot of progress, although I think it's safe to say we still don't really understand the detailed uh, elements of the mechanism of the water oxidation. Um, and so that's still a very active uh, research area. And so just to come back to this question of the transition from the anoxygenic, this sort of shows the purple bacterial reaction center in a, in a very sort of simplified manner, and then this is the energetics of it. The length of this arrow represents the type of photon, the, the energy of the photon that's used to, uh, to do the uh, electron transfer. And when you get to the uh, oxygen evolving system, you use a much higher uh, energy photon, and that probably represents a shift of types of pigments that are in the system. And to, to make this sort of transition from this much simpler system to this much more complex system, it's too large of a change to occur in one step, and there had to have been multiple intermediates, and we really don't understand the nature of those intermediates very much, uh, very well. And there have been various uh, suggestions about, well, where might the oxygen evolving system have originated in terms of evolutionary uh, uh, source and so on. Um, and some of these are shown, some of these ideas are shown here uh, in this slide. And these include things such as uh, manganese catalase, which is an uh, interesting system because it does actually uh, produce oxygen and it has a dim dimanganese system, which has some similarity. This is actually an older version of the structure, which is not quite right anymore. But uh, the idea here is that the manganese catalase may have some structural similarity there. Uh, there's a new paper by Jim Barber that just came out that talks about the uh, carbon monoxide dehydrogenase uh, complex, 
uh, and how it has some structural similarity to it. That doesn't include manganese, uh, so I'm not sure that one's really quite as relevant. And then there's some suggestions, and this is from a paper by Ken Sauer and Vidal Yashandra, but it goes back really to some, some suggestions of Mike Russell some years ago uh, that manganese minerals may have served as sort of a templating uh, structure. I don't understand how that then can get incorporated into the system and ultimately be genetically encoded and so on. So there's still a lot of questions about how that happened, and I'd say that's really the biggest unsolved uh, question about how this whole thing works. So uh, just as a final slide here, the, uh, the question uh, comes up, and especially relevant for this group, is oxygenic photosynthesis an inevitable evolutionary development? And uh, oxygenic photosynthesis is mechanistically much more complicated than anoxygenic <laughs> photosynthesis. So I think any time you go to any world, uh, once photosynthesis can get started, it will probably start with some form of anoxygenic photosynthesis. It's just so much simpler mechanistically, energetically, and so on. And so uh, it's, it's a, uh, the advantage uh, of oxygenic photosynthesis is it uses this ubiquitous electron donor uh, water, and so that gives you uh, essentially an unlimited source of reductant that you don't have with a lot of the reductants that are used in the various anoxygenic systems. So it gives you a tremendous upside potential. And it's also the case that it has this very, uh, you're using, uh, you're creating a redox couple with oxygen and the reduced uh, acceptor that has a lot of free energy stored in it. And so it's really uh, thermodynamically probably the most efficient system uh, that, uh, that you'll have. So it's, it's uh, perhaps an, an inevitable evolutionary development, but it's certainly not the initial one, and you might well find a world that uh, had not yet made that transition from anoxygenic to oxygenic photosynthesis. And that's the end. I'll uh, just acknowledge this is a question that we've thought about in our group for many years, and some of my former uh, students, uh, Jason Raymond, uh, who was a student with me some years ago, and Wes Swing Swingley, who's here, uh, contributed a lot to some of the early uh, work on this. Martin Holman Marriott and Sumedha Sadakar uh, also did uh, a lot of work, and uh, we've had various collaborators. Uh, and this has been supported by NASA for many years through the exobiology and the astrobiology, and right now I'm a member of the, uh, the Virtual Planetary Laboratory. And so thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, hi, Bob. Dave Neal. Hi, Dave. So clearly it's established that anoxygenic photosystems came first. Then you had this duplication to give you the two photosystems. And then, of course, you have the cyanobacterial development. What's the evidence for the relative timing between the duplication to form the two anoxygenic things and oxygenic photosynthesis? It seems like that was a very exciting time when you got the duplication. Was, yeah. Wasn't that a possible time also to, to do the other? Well, these gene duplications didn't. There, as I showed on that one diagram, there were three separate gene duplication events that caused the heterodimeric structure of the reaction center, and those didn't all happen at the same time. Clearly, the one that formed the photosystem one is a much more recent uh, development, because if you look at the two halves of photosystem one, they're actually quite similar to each other. And so that gene duplication was a fairly recent one. Uh, the other one is actually the most interesting, the sort of the type two reaction centers, in that you have this long edge on the tree, and then you get uh, the, the divergence into the, the, what I would call the purple bacterial type of type two reaction centers and photosystem two, and then independent gene duplications there. Uh, and there's a long, long period there that probably was not oxygen, almost certainly was not oxygen evolving. I, I, I don't see how the oxygen ev evolution part could really work until after the duplication in the 
photosystem two part because the oxygen evolving complex is, is very asymmetric in the, in the complex, in the system. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you used the term the mosaic evolution of photosynthesis and you referred to the, I guess, the independent origin of uh, antenna and reaction centers and pigments. Do you have any idea what those three components were doing before they were assembled as a mosaic? Well, that's an interesting question. In some cases, the, uh, these modules, for example, the carbon fixation machineries, are shared with non-photosynthetic organisms. So like the Calvin Benson cycle, it's found in a number of non-photosynthetic organisms and some of these other carbon cycles. And so there you can imagine that this uh, carbon fixation capability developed independently and then different photosynthetic organisms sort of imported one or another of these uh, carbon fixation cycles that suited its needs. Uh, <clears throat> other, other parts of the system are a little harder to see that way. For example, the the reaction center complex. We don't really have any idea of whether it had any kind of previous life as a different uh, type of uh, electron transfer complex. It doesn't really show much similarity in terms of structure to anything other than other reaction centers. And so other things, some of them are clearly shared with other organisms, non-photosynthetic organisms, and probably were imported uh, in such a way, while others were almost certainly invented along the way by the photosynthetic organisms themselves. But, but pigments? Well, the pigments are interesting cases. I, I briefly alluded to the fact that the biosynthesis of chlorophyll is uh, the same as the heme biosynthesis up to a point, and then they branch off. You put iron in and make a heme, you put magnesium in, and it goes down the chlorophyll branch. Uh, so clearly that, that's a shared pathway up to that branch point. Um, and probably the first photosynthetic pigments were, were similar to the sort of more symmetric porphyrins that you see as hemes. But those don't actually absorb light very well. And so there'd be a very strong selection pressure to, uh, to fiddle with the structure of those molecules to make them better light absorbers. And the, the chlorophylls are really amazing in the, in the sort of all the different functional groups and the, they've got asymmetry built into them now which shifts the absorption to longer wavelengths and so on. And so that undoubtedly is a product of a long evolutionary uh, progression uh, as well. Yes, Bob, that's awesome. Uh, so as you I know, know that uh, 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 the pigments are sort of something that I care a lot about. Um, uh, <coughs> so that's a nice segue to this. So uh, currently, to get, to get oxygenic photosynthesis, you need a lot of energy, which we get in two stages through two different reaction centers. What sort of wavelength would it take in a single photon absorbance event to give you enough energy if we had started not from wherever we started, we still don't know where that, that, that first starting event was. If we had started somewhere else with a different set of pigments, might we have gotten there in, in one shot to have enough energy? In a single photo, uh, photo yeah, system. So what kind of wavelength would that have yeah. been? Um, there's been a lot of thinking about this question, as you might imagine. Uh, one, of the, one of the efforts that's very active now is to try to improve the efficiency of photosynthesis, mostly from a sort of an agricultural or bioenergy point of view. And the, the existing architecture of photosynthesis obviously has this long evolutionary history, and it's probably, it's almost certainly not the most optimum uh, arrangement that one could, could imagine. Uh, and the fact that you have the two coupled photosystems uh, allows you to have this very large redox span from oxygen on one end and, and NADP on the other end. To do that all with a single photon you'd have to probably use a much shorter wavelength photon, say something in the 500 nanometer range. And then anything beyond that would perhaps not have sufficient energy because of the Planck law uh, to, to cause the, to be able to create this very large redox span. So you'd be losing out on a large part of the, of the electromagnetic spectrum to do that. Now there are various scenarios that people are, 
talking about so-called radical redesign of the reactions or of the photosynthetic process to have one system that sort of works on that green light and that goes all the way to NADP and then have a second system that works way out in the near infrared and does cyclic electron flow to generate a bunch of ATP and uh, that way you could serve, you could fulfill the energetic needs and cover the spectrum uh, in a more comprehensive way and and uh, perhaps inc uh, increase the efficiency but that's there's a lot of a lot of steps to get there <laughs> Hi. but the question of the long wavelength limit is something that has been looked at a lot lately and uh, these chlorophyll D containing organisms have kind of pushed that level uh, that long wavelength limit out it used to be thought it was 700 nanometers now it's thought to be at least 750 Mike Wong from Caltech. Uh, I think my question has to do with the previous two questions. Um, so astronomers often think about looking for the red edge as a biosignature. So as an expert in photosynthesis, I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about where that comes from, in particular, whether or not there are actually many different red edges for the different types of antenna that you described, sure. and also whether or not you think that the red edge would shift uh, for, uh, for life on planets around stars that emit a different wavelengths. Right. Well, there's been a lot of discussion about that, and Nikki Parento gave a very nice uh, talk on just that question earlier in the week. But uh, with different types of pigments, you will certainly get that red edge occurring at different wavelengths. So it's not always, it, the reason it occurs at 700 nanometers uh, on Earth is because you're, you're looking at the terrestrial vegetation. The red edge is, if you look from, a reflectance spectrum from the Earth, or from space back at the Earth, you look at light reflected off the vegetation, there's very little visible light that's, that's reflected. And once you get to 700 nanometers, it shoots up and much higher intensity. And that's the so-called red edge. And that simply, I mean, there are various explanations for it, but the sort of biggest reason for that is that the, the chlorophyll absorbs all that light from 400 to 700 nanometers, the visible range. And uh, so most of that light gets taken in and never comes back out of the, of the organism. Uh, the light past 700 nanometers is not absorbed at all. And so that light can easily be scattered back. And that's what's the sort of uh, uh, idea about the red edge or the, the source of the red edge. And there's been uh, also discussion about this question of, of other stars, for example, M-class stars and so on. And Nancy Kang has done some nice uh, simulations on that. And probably you would find that the pigments that you find on a, on a world that's doing photosynthesis from an M-class star would be different and they'd be further red shifted. And the mechanism, you could have some significant mechanistic differences. Uh, so I think that the, 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 the life would adapt to that particular photic environment, just like all the different types of antenna complexes have evolved uh, uh, to adapt organisms on Earth to different photic environments. You'd see a similar sort of uh, process that would go on on, a, on an extrasolar planet. Thanks. Yep. So we don't have time for more questions. We have another brief presentation. <laughs> 